Good morning, everyone. And welcome and thank you for joining us this morning. And a special welcome to our guest, David Hazoni. Um, have I lost? Where's the one? Let's continue on. So David's an American-born writer and an award-winning editor and translator. We first met in 2012 at the Emerge. Neither of us have strong memories of that meeting, but we were there and uh, it's funny. And our reconnection was actually before this period. Um, David has his, his um, newest work is Jewish Priorities, which I hope you started to hear something about as we're promoting the event when David will be here in the UK, actually at JW3, to talk about the book with some of the contributors. 65 Proposals for the Future of Our People, a remarkable array of new essays, which was brought into a new kind of relief when the war started and uh, we had the massacres of the 7th of October and everything pivoted. He's now also the new director uh, of, and Steinhardt Senior Fellow at the Z3 Institute for Jewish Priorities, and which is a very exciting new position. David is happy to take questions, so please put them in the chat as we go along. David, welcome. It's not an easy task, but what's uppermost on your mind this week that you'd like to share with us? Over to you. Well, <clears throat> thank you so much, Judy. Uppermost in my mind is that uh, you recover from COVID and feel better as quickly as possible. Thanks. Um, uh, I, I will begin with something uh, with just a strange personal experience and an observation from the past week. Uh, I live in Jerusalem. And during the first part of the war, I noticed that Jerusalem and Tel Aviv were experiencing it very differently because Tel Aviv was having a constant flow of rockets uh, being shot at, at their city. And Jerusalem had virtually almost none the entire since the war began. There have been very, you know, here and there, maybe a total of three or four times that Jerusalemites have had to run for shelter. Uh, and that was all in the first two or three months. Uh, since then, the rockets have dissipated and neither Tel Aviv nor Jerusalem is is uh, really uh, feeling them. But there is another difference. And I only really noticed this when I took the train to Tel Aviv two days ago for, for meetings. When you get off the train in Tel Aviv, you're very immediately confronted by um by the campaign to to for, on behalf of the hostages you see along the streets you see tents with posters you see people who are volunteering to talk about the hostages to talk about individual you know it, it's very very present in tel aviv um in jerusalem obviously we're aware of the hostages and obviously we see here and there the posters, and especially if there are Jerusalemites who are being held captive. But in Jerusalem, there's a much greater awareness of the fallen soldiers. Every few days, we lose another soldier in battle, and and disproportionately, they come from Jerusalem and what's known as the periphery cities. Um, my neighborhood of uh, Armona Natsiv and Arnona, we've probably had a dozen uh, fallen soldiers since the war began, if not if not more, and it's really there are funerals and and this constant. So it's almost as though to to say in a sort of macabre way, it's almost like we have two competing, acute, horrifying, ongoing traumas that really just depends on the emphasis and on what you're thinking about on a given day. Um, but but both the the situation of ongoing hostages and the situation of ongoing battle um with all that that entails is traumatic and ongoing um so i just wanted to mention that observation it doesn't necessarily affect um the the political realities or the negotiations that are being conducted or the battle itself but um, but it is part of the experience that I think is worth worth noting. Um, in terms of the 
the state of the war and the state of the Israeli kind of mindset vis-a-vis -vis the war. Um, Israel, Israelis as a whole do not seem to be changing in any way in terms of their, their fundamental determination that this war uh, be conducted to the point where we can comfortably say that our residents can move back to their homes and that we've forestalled any future massive terror attacks, at least from the Gaza Strip, indefinitely. That has always been the goal alongside retrieving the hostages. Um, and it continues to be the goal. And I think that um, that we still have a great majority of the population that supports these goals, that supports our troops, that um, wants to do everything necessary uh, to uh, make sure that that our government as a whole has the backing that it needs from the people. Um, it's not really about Netanyahu, even though he's quite unpopular these days, but the actual conduct of the war and the goals of the war are, are really solidly within a much broader consensus than those who support him politically. Um, and therefore, I, I want to just ask of you, beg of you, that in general, when you're listening to non-Israeli commentaries about what's going on, um, anytime you hear somebody tell you that this is somehow Netanyahu's war, or that he's leading, or that he's pushing the country, you know, towards war and so forth, um, you can safely disregard anything that person says on any subject in general, because um, this is not any Israeli who's living through this will tell you that it's not his war. He's following and he's not leading. It's uh, a war that the people insist must take place. Um, and despite the cost, despite the awfulness, despite the pain, despite the international relative isolation, though I have something to say about that as well, um, it, it's um, we, we need to do this because we've gone through so many rounds of violence that you know, that took many people's lives with Gaza since the disengagement from Gaza in 2005. You know, there was 2009 and 2013 and, and 2007. I, I, I lose track and I'm sure others do too. And with all these different operations like Protective Edge and Cast Lead and all of these different names. And and we're, we're done. We're done with it. We, we're not willing to play this game anymore of uh, mowing the lawn, as they used to call it. We are um, determined to effect a fundamental change in Gaza to turn Gaza into a place that's actually um, inter that's actually wants to co cooperate with us on building something new and better, rather than uh, in a permanent state of resistance um, and violent and commitment to violence. And it'll take a long time, even after the war. It'll take a very long time. But hopefully there will be sufficient partners um, around the region and around the world who are willing to help us make sure that, it, that it, it's doable and achievable and can happen. Um, and if, again, you have any questions about my thoughts on what that ought to look like, I'm happy to go into it um, more deeply. Um, in terms of the, the, the military side of it, which I, I don't think is talked about enough in the English language discourse, I think that... There's so much noise around the false claims of genocide and this is happening and that's happening. And, and there, there is a fundamental reality that is not really be coming out, which is that Israel has conducted a very careful, very methodical, uh, nearly impossible war against an enemy that uses, it's, it, it's not that it, hides behind civilians the way the way most people on our side usually say it hamas doesn't just hide behind civilians hamas built an entire civilian reality that was essentially serving as a prop for its own organizational and military needs there isn't a, there are, isn't a town there aren't schools that do not have weapons stored in various rooms or entrances to tunnels there is the, the entirety of the Gaza Strip has been revealed to be something other than a, a, a city where civilians live. It was a, it was it's almost like a, a Potemkin Potemkin 
village where where Hamas was using and continues to be using civilians every single day in every single military affair possible. Um, and this is what our soldiers are discovering as they go in house to house, town to town. Um, th th it's an endless, endless thing. Um, and yet, despite it all, and we see this from the numbers, Israel has managed to dismantle 18 out of the 24 Hamas battalions, or, or perhaps of, out of 22, I don't recall. Um, and by dismantling a battalion, it means that they've lost their capacity to function as a battalion. Instead, they, they, they've broken up into small terror cells, which we know how to deal with much much more effectively. Hamas has probably lost or taken out of out of action more than 50% of their, of their soldiers. And they started the war with between 30 and 40,000 soldiers. Um, the progress towards the goal of dismantling Hamas is being made in a systematic and successful fashion um, at a relatively, uh, and I, I know that every fallen IDF soldier is a tragedy, but at a relatively low cost to, you know, we're talking about two to 300 soldiers. It's not desirable war is never desirable but as wars go as the numbers of wars go and and this it, it's really quite remarkable and this includes the, the numbers of civilian casualties that are so often quoted we don't really have a number but let's we go with the number 30,000 even though that's a Hamas number because we don't nobody is proposing any alternative numbers but if it is an accurate number then what it means is that Israel is achieving something like a one to one ratio of com combatants versus civilian casualties which is an unheard of low uh, civilian casualty rate um, in urban warfare, in the history of urban warfare, um, and in the history of warfare in general. It's simply not a gen, not only is it not a genocide, but it is a preposterously low apparent figure of civilian casualties compared to combatants. You won't know this from the Hamas figures because Hamas does not distinguish between civilians and combatants, not on the Israeli side and not on the Palestinian side. Um, the uh, As far as they're concerned, Israel has killed 30,000 people, and that's genocide, both of which, both of the statements are uh, nonsense statements. Um, 30,000 is nonsense because it doesn't distinguish between combatants and civilians, and genocide is, is nonsense because, um, because A, there is no genocidal intent, and B, that's not how you measure genocide. Um, and I'm not going to go into that unless you guys really want me to, because um, because it's an, I, I don't think that, I, I'm here to tell you things you might not already know, and, and listing additional arguments about why it's not genocide is something I assume many of you have also heard and have had rehearsed at you for many different people. Um, if you feel a need, then again, in the Q&A, I'd be happy to discuss. Um, I, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, um, my own personal connection to the war, uh, and then finally with maybe something on the politics side. Um, I went to bed on October 6th with two kids in the IDF, one in uh, a special forces unit called Egoz, and the other in, um, in intelligence, uh, what we call SIGINT, which is uh, signal intelligence, meaning just a fancy way of saying she's dealing with gadgets and is not going to see combat. Um, I had two in uniform on October 6th. By October 8th, I had five in uniform. Um, I have a daughter in the dog unit, Okets. I have a son in tanks. I have another son who had been in the Air Force and is now in infantry. Um, at any rate, it's been a very difficult time for me watching the battles. Three of those three reservists have already been released. Um, however, there's still a there's still two two in the army. I saw the uh, special forces one who called me up from Khan Yunus and said, "Hey, how are you doing, I'm Khan Yunus? If you're going to America, can you please bring me and then a list?" Um, the um, but but in addition to all of this, and and the war feels like it's winding down, regardless of how long we'll actually be there, and because we've done most of the military part of it has been has been accomplished. And, and the rest of it needs to be finalized. In Rafa, we need to go in and finish off Hamas once and for all. Um, but then there is 
a very big looming question about the North, about Lebanon, about whether there's going to be a massive war with Hezbollah, which will be much larger and much more difficult and painful. Um, and especially for a, a, a parent of children in, you know, in reserves, the idea of having to go through this again with a more, a better equipped and better trained uh, and more experienced army and larger in in Lebanon is not exactly um, exciting or desirable. On the other hand, there are tens of thousands of Israelis who cannot live in their homes along the northern border. Tens of thousands who are currently living in hotels or being put up in different places. Their kids do not have schools to attend. Um, their lives have been completely and thoroughly disrupted. And about 500 of their homes have been destroyed by Hezbollah um, RPGs or rockets of different kinds. Um, it's not a tolerable situation. It's not a situation that we can just, you know, Hezbollah decides one day they want to stop shooting. It's not a situation that we can just go back and say, oh, okay, no worries. We got it. We got it. It's covered. We'll go send our people back in and we'll just pretend none of this ever happened. It doesn't work that way. Okay, we, we cannot tolerate a situation where whenever Hezbollah feels like um, driving our people out of their homes for months on end uh, through rocket harassment, that they should feel free to do so. So again, here, we don't have the simple, there's no simple solution in which they just stop shooting. It, it requires either a diplomatic or a military solution that involves uh, distancing Hezbollah significantly from the, from the border. Um, applying and executing the provisions of UN Security Council Resolution 1701, which was in the wake of the Second Lebanon War, uh, basically requires their uh, disarmament. Um, all, something has to happen in the North as well. So we're in a state of ongoing, intense, real conflict, uh, real pain, real trauma. Um, and Alongside all of this, I just want to make sure that we're okay on time. I'll, I'll take a few more minutes and open up to questions. Alongside all of this, there is another conflict going on, which is the conflict that's taking place in the diaspora, the rise of anti-Semitism, the conflict against the Jew, the Jews, or as I put in a uh, in an essay I published in the Sapir Journal, what I call the war against the Jews has been launched, and that is taking place on many many different levels. It began with the sudden and surprising embracing of Hamas by so many progressive groups and organizations that had previously just said, oh, we're not anti-Semitic, we're merely anti-Zionist, or we 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 disagree with the the occupation or the specific policies of policies of the Netanyahu government. No, it turns out they actually are pro October 7th. People who celebrated, who who started screaming genocide on October 7th, before Israel had even begun to retaliate. The the people who who semi-delighted in, in, in celebrating what had happened on October 7th because it was an act of resistance against the um, occupying colonialist apartheid, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, regime. Um, and the problem is that and I want to may perhaps leave you that with this is a big, huge question mark. Israel will defeat Hamas. Hamas will be gone from Gaza. It'll exist as an organization with offices here and there and everywhere, but not in Gaza. Um, that war will end. But the forces that have been unleashed around the world against Jews, they're not going anywhere. The masks have come off. And we as a people need to figure out what that means about our future. I, my recommendation is that we need to gird for battle, assume that the diaspora has much more power than it really believes if it works in a coordinated fashion, and claim our position in countries all over the world where we have a right to live and 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 you know as as much as before. But other people may have different opinions on what the future holds and more than happy to talk about that as well. Um, I think I'll stop for now and allow a little time for questions and answers. Does that make sense?
that's amazing thank you so much that was very um very full and very full that's the word <laughs> yes absolutely thank you okay question one why don't we just uh is so where do you think this war leaves us with the abram accords what's your view on that i think that if if we successfully destroy Hamas, it increases the likelihood of more peace agreements with um, with Gulf states, particularly Saudi Arabia, uh, because Hamas, first of all, Hamas is part of the Iranian web that is in opposition to the Gulf states. Um, and as far as they're concerned, Hamas needs to be destroyed. It is part of Iran's strength, and it is um, uh, undermining and threatening their own regimes. That's reason number one. Reason number two is that the stronger Israel looks, the more attractive Israel is as a partner. Um, very simply put, if we fail to destroy our enemies in war, we look weaker. And in the Middle East, that's a very big deal. Um, and so there's less of an incentive and more pressure on the regimes not to make peace agreements with us because Israel is a smaller thing than it was beforehand when they started started the thing. So I really do believe that um, Israel becomes a more popular regional player if, if and when it destroys Hamas. It'll become more popular still if it uh, vanquishes Hezbollah to the north, but that again is a much bigger ask. Um, I, seriously, I, I think now America has an election and coming and all of this is mixed in and the timing of things could be very different depending on who, who wins the election. But I've seen th things happen in the past that lead me to believe that um, it is very possible that we will see normalization with Saudi Arabia beginning late January of 2025, um, because that's, you know, it, again, that's when the inauguration of the U.S. president is, and that in politics makes a difference. That's why the um, the, the U.S. hostages being held in Iran um, were released in, in January 20th, I believe, 1981, because that was when Reagan was sworn into office. Um, this, there's, a, there's a game here, and... Uh, um, but the short answer is, I think, I very strongly believe that Israel, that the pace of normalization with the Arab world will be in direct proportion to the completeness of the victory over Hamas. Of course, um, before the elections, which we also have coming in the UK and probably in Israel too, we, we hope because that will mean that, that things have uh, settled more. Um, we've now just started Ramadan. And uh, there's been quite a lot of conversation here about, you know, whether that will increase the violence. Is there any talk in Israel about that? Have you, have you any thoughts about it? Well, certainly Hamas wants violence to increase during Ramadan. Uh, Ramadan is a time in which people are fasting and hearing all kinds of speeches from all kinds of religious leaders and who whip them up into a certain kind of excitement, and that excitement can be expressed in violence as well. Um, so I certainly think that it's a time where more violence can happen. Uh, people very often forget that the Yom Kippur was also war in 1973, was also launched during Ramadan. Um, I, only, I forget, I only recently learned it. Um, but uh, I, I have a feeling that Hamas doesn't see themselves as really needing to make a deal yet. I could be wrong. And uh, and Israelis are running out of patience with Hamas and with and and therefore are going to be more interested in launching the final phase of the Gaza war in Rafa uh, or Rafiah, as we say, um, in in the next couple of weeks. That's a gut feeling. It just seems like. Israelis are are sensing that the international pressure goes up over time and that completing the war needs to be done sooner rather than later. Obviously, there are details 
involving both the civilian population as well as the hostages, as well as the location of the leaders and extremely, extremely complex operation. But these are operational questions that we'll need to have operational answers. But it leads us very nicely to the next question, which is how do you view the day after? The Biden and um, much of the West, Lord Cameron included, talk vaguely about two states. Um, what are the Israelis talking about in this context that you're aware of? So I can tell you the official position and I can tell you my position. Um, the official position is not to talk about two states, to talk about a long-term um, a long-term occupation, military occupation that will also include the creation of some kind of civilian authority that is not the current uh, Palestinian authority. It, it's it's still quite vague as far as I can tell. Um, to me, the answer is really, really simple. Long time, long term, but simple. Um, I think that we need a joint plan by Israel, the United States, and the Gulf states to create a new Gaza, glorious and beautiful, um, that will serve the Gulf states as a Mediterranean port for their trade and will serve the people of Gaza as a an engine of a new economy. Um, it will require a kind of what, what has been called in the past denazification process. It will require new schools and new educational materials and, and a zero tolerance policy for resistance and, um, you know, a, a call it a Marshall Plan, whatever you want to call it. it, it will require something quite intense and significant with as little Israeli involvement as possible, although at the beginning there will be more Israeli involvement, is my guess. If you want to call it a Palestinian state, I don't mind calling it that. If you want to call it New Gaza City, or what, what's the name of the Saudi long, huge thing that they're building, uh, Naom, uh, whatever that's called, like Naom 2, however you want to call it, I think that there are the resources available, there's the will, I think it would be the best possible thing to ever happen to the residents of Gaza, um, and I think that it'll provide peace on our southern border indefinitely. Okay, so I have two more questions and only three more minutes. Okay. I'll give you both questions and you can decide whether to do quick answers for both or choose okay. one. Um, so the hostages, obviously, are all desperate for them to be released. It's been five months, it's too long. Um, but the question is, surely the only way to get the hostage released must be with a peace treaty. That's question one. Question two is, could you say something about the UN security that was supposed to be in southern Lebanon protecting the border? Um. Yeah, uh, let me dismiss the first, the second question first, because UN security, UN peacekeepers never actually keep, keep peace. They didn't keep it with uh, in in Sinai against Egypt. They didn't. They they're just standing there, not really doing that much. And when the forces of war happen, they merely get in the way rather than preventing any actual violence. So that's UNFO. We'll leave that to the side. Um, I don't know that hostages need to be, look, look, we have a hostage situation in the classic sense of the term. The closer we get to zeroing in on where they're being held in Rafiach, the more it will res resemble a hostage standoff where the, the, the there are hostage takers and there are hostages and uh, whether they can be re released through an agreement or through uh, um, a military operation or through uh, starting a military operation, getting them to say, to agree to the agreement, um, does it mean that they get a an airplane, fake passports, and the destination of their choice? Does it mean that they get to, you know, live in an Israeli jail uh, rather than die? Uh, I'm talking about the hostage takers, the Hamas leadership. These are all questions that can be negotiated at the, at the moment and on the spot. Um, but we won't get to any kind of agreement with them if we don't continue the military pressure, because that's the only thing that brings them to the table at all. Um, so I don't know if it'll be a peace deal. I don't think Hamas is constitutionally capable of making peace with us, but what we can have is a deal in which they get to not die in exchange for releasing their hostages. 
Okay, um, I usually ask for a, for a little bit of optimism in the final sentence. Do you optimism. feel any optimism? Sure. Um, so let's begin with the fact that Israel is still Israel, and our people are still our people, and we are productive and having babies and having marriages, and I just had my fourth grandchild, and um, and there's a lot of Mazal Tov, and yes, we're feeling the pain and feeling the suffering and very determined, but the just as the flip side of what all the horrors that have been revealed in the diaspora and the betrayals and the traumas and all of that, the flip side is that in Israel we've had revealed an incredible, incredible spirit of our younger generation. Something that none of us knew about really until until the moment came, until the, the, the test came. You know, we, we always talk about the greatest generation is the generation that fought, fought in World War II. But Israelis are astonished by the qualities that our kids have displayed. Just astonished. And that, that gives me good, a tremendous amount of hope for the future of this country. It is a voice of optimism and it is wonderful. It's just uh, what, 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 how awful that we had to discover it. And um, five months in that, uh, that yep. these young people are still obviously dying and it's as you say uh, too many deaths on both sides it's just horrendous yep. David thank you so much uh, it was real and honest and in depth and we are very very grateful to you thank you for sharing with us this morning Look thank you all I hope to see you on April 15th at, uh, at JW3 and, uh, and I think that uh, Judy posted the link to the book as well if you'd like to purchase it on Amazon um uh so uh i hope to see you all soon thank you so Lovely. much Judy. thank you shabbat shalom to you shabbat shalom, shabbat shalom to everyone who's joined us this morning please take care of yourselves and look forward to seeing you next week take care okay. everyone bye